Janet is the founder of Child Friendly Faith Project, the co-host of the podcast Parenting Beyond, Beyond Belief, and a board member of Foundation Beyond Belief. Her presentation is Only Humanists Can Stop Religious Child Abuse and Neglect. Hi, everybody, and thanks so much for caring about this issue. I'm going to try something I haven't done before with a talk, which is I'm not going to depress the hell out of you. <laughs> um, no, actually, there is some really great news that we can talk about uh, with this issue. And, and I think that's just because there, advocates have been doing great work to try to raise awareness of religious child abuse and neglect. And uh, the, the general public, you know, is waking up and, and understanding what the risk factors are and that just because something has a, you know, religious theme to it doesn't necessarily mean that it's always great for children. Um, and I want to talk specifically, too, about why I believe that humanists are best suited to protect children. First, I just wanted to make sure we're all clear on what I mean by religious child maltreatment. Uh, maltreatment is child abuse and neglect, and RCM is child abuse or neglect that is enabled by religious belief, practice, or doctrine. So many different ways that this can manifest itself, but there are those people who are ideologically driven to harm children um, using religious messaging. Uh, sometimes it is used to control uh, children, as well as abuse and neglect them. Um, the third one's really important because it's, it's important to understand that there are many perpetrators that them, themselves have been victimized. Uh, a lot of times perpetrators have been raised in a harmful religious environment since birth, and it's kind of all they know. And one of the risk factors that go with religious child maltreatment is in, in, in a, they're always in authoritarian religious cultures is that there's social separatism. There's fear-mongering and a strict social hierarchy. And when that happens, um, it's very difficult for children to be protected. There's no one really there looking out for them because the best suited people to do that are their parents. And they are the most common perpetrators. Uh, but uh, I will get into a little bit later how my nonprofit is actually working with parents, some who are perpetrators. Um, and, and it's been very effective to uh, help people understand more about the issue. I'm going to just skip over the rest of the slide. Part of it is, is the harm, and the other part of it is the justification, using religious messaging to justify child abuse and neglect, allowing it to continue on and on um, so that no one's stopping it. And so you see some of these that you might be familiar with. It's God's will is, is, is a real winner. Um, the, the us against them mentality, our religious freedoms are under attack, and the government's trying to shut that down. So that's been used to uh, prevent people from reporting abuse to, to outside authorities. Some current cases that you're probably familiar with, uh, this, this is a family, uh, the Turpin family in California, and this couple believed that uh, they were called upon by God to have many children. And, and you will hear that from many people of faith who end up having lots and lots of kids. Uh, it's, it's usually a sign of danger to come. Uh, even with the most well-meaning parents, um, if you don't have the financial means to take care of uh, 17 children, you really shouldn't have that many kids. In this case, this couple had 13 kids, and they severely abused and neglected all but the youngest one. Um, for many years, they had them shackled to their beds. They denied them uh, food and water. They let them shower one day a year. Uh, they forced them to, in some cases, memorize the whole Bible and so forth. And back to that justification, the parents of Mr. Turpin, uh, they were completely shocked to learn that this was going on because they thought that this couple were good Christians. In Idaho, more children die of faith-based medical neglect than any other state. 
Uh, that's partly because that state has religious exemptions that fail to hold perpetrators accountable. So under the statute that they've had in place since the 1970s, as long as you are only using prayer to treat your child, air quotes there, um, and you're not, we're not going, you know, seeking any medical care, then you will not be prosecuted for uh, allowing your child to get uh, very sick, disabled, or even die. And, and we will hear legislators who support this say in public hearings, as this gentleman did, and in his case, uh, this legislator who is wanting to keep the religious exemptions in place, uh, he's envious of, of the kids who suffer severely, uh, many of them suffering and dying from treatable illnesses, and what he said in an open hearing is those children that have gone on, they're probably where we're all trying to get. They're there. They've got it made. If we can just live a righteous life one day, we'll be with them again. The gentleman on the left is a man named Brian Brzee, and he is a sixth generation Mormon. Uh, the child that's with him uh, is his son Samuel, who uh, five years ago, uh, made the choice to kill himself based on uh, severe bullying that was going on in his church and among uh, Mormon children in his school. Uh, Brian reached out to us because, and, and I will say that um, in two days is the death anniversary of, of Samuel, um, he strongly felt that LDS teach, teachings, the teachings of the Church of Latter-day Saints directly impacted his son's choice to kill himself, and I'll get into that a little bit later. Um, but the church for many decades has been extremely homophobic and um, using religious messaging uh, based on uh, extremist views of sexual purity to uh, emotionally abuse children. And finally, this is an example of religious institutional abuse. Some of you may have known, seen some of the news that came out. Uh, my nonprofit has been instrumental in shedding light on decades of abuse, say egregious abuses, torture, um, ongoing rapes, and so forth at this uh, North Texas facility called Cal Farley's Boys Ranch. It's a very powerful, privately run institution that's been in place since 1939. And until very recently, people in the general public were not aware that uh, this abu these abuses have been going on, but we found out about it, and uh, so, so now um, the rest of the world knows about it. Um, but it is, it is faith-based. Uh, they say that they conduct their practices in a uh, Jesus-centered environment. So what kind of role can we humanists play in all of this? It is my belief that humanists understand the problem better than anyone else, and they are the least likely people to perpetrate it. If you take a look at or you know, just our, our own understanding of humanist values, such as some of these I've pulled from the Humanist Manifesto 3. Us looking at the world and wanting to make conclusions based on evidence-based reasoning, uh, our desire to um, reach out to other individuals and just make our lives better, uh, and, and, um, and, then, and then just, you know, I think that our, our respect of the individual, respect of other human beings. I mean, if, if, if anyone was to uphold humanist values, it would be, in my view, virtually impossible for them to religiously abuse or neglect a child. And uh, my, my nonprofit, the Child Friendly Faith Project, conducted a survey last year. Uh, we were just curious, who is caring about this topic? Who is following us? And so the survey uh, was taken by 72 people, and we asked a lot about people's backgrounds and their religiosity and so forth. And when we asked the question, what is your current religious or worldview? We had people all different uh, faiths and, and philosophies. But uh, as you can see, the, the second category is by far the largest. These are secular people, people who consider themselves to be humanist, um, atheist, secular. And the, the same when we asked about religiosity. Those with 
the least amount of relig religiosity were following this topic uh, by a large margin. So, so what can we do to help? Uh, these are some basic types of ad advocacy efforts that we, we strongly support and we're involved in, and we encourage uh, any of you to join us in this. Uh, exposing problematic religious organizations, partnering with religious individuals and organizations that actually care about this, uh, steering away from uh, discussions about religion, that doesn't help. <laughs> we want to reach out and find common goals, and there are many people of faith that do really care about this topic. Most of them tend to be very liberal. Uh, publicizing per people's personal stories and improving legislation and policies. Now, I'll just go through a few really uh, positive things happening uh, along that front. California is poised to pass a law, uh, pass a bill that will require clergy to report abuse that is heard in confession. Now we could, we do feel this law could be strengthened, but it's a great first step because for a very long time the Catholic Church and other uh, religious organizations, especially, especially the large powerful ones, have been able to uh, jump into the confessional loophole and, and not report abuse because they say they heard it in confession. A number of states have greatly extended their statute, statutes of limitations, including New York very recently, and now Texas. Uh, Colorado just became the 18th state to ban conversion therapy, so-called conversion therapy, for LGBTQ teens. But I also want to draw attention to a different kind of model. And the Child Friendly Faith Project has been putting our energy and resources uh, into yet another way to uh, protect children and raise awareness. And I think that this whole model is really based in humanist values when you think about it. Uh, essentially, we want to have direct service to adult survivors of religious child maltreatment, and also families of children who have been harmed or are being harmed. Uh, the whole model here is very different than what many religious organizations do when they are trying to serve their communities. Uh, there's usually a transactional element to that. So for example, uh, a soup kitchen will welcome in the homeless, but for them to be able to have a meal, they have to listen to a sermon. Or a religious organization will say, well, we'll educate your children, but we are going to convert them. Uh, we consider that to be unethical and, a, a, and, and, and not a humanist approach at all. Um, our preference is that there is more of a partnership there so that both, both, both par parties are getting a great deal out of it. Uh, the native Australian Willa, excuse me, Lilla Watson really tapped into this when she said, if you have come here to help me, you are wasting your time. But if you have come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let's work together. And that's, that's kind of the spirit of this. So that by joining forces with survivors and families whose children have been harmed, we are creating a really healthy and sustaining partnership that upholds humanist values. Um, our partners, the survivors and families, what the two things that they most want and what we really recognize and respond to is that they're looking for community. So many have been talking about this or thinking about this totally alone. And so that's a big part of what we do for them and also raising awareness of their issues. Uh, they believe that it's critical that they get out there to talk about this and educate people so that there aren't more victims. And so we, we offer guidance in that respect. But we're not telling them what to do. We're asking them, what do you think is the answer, and providing guidance and support. So for the example, I talked to you about Brian Brzee and his son, Samuel. Um, Brian reached out to us, and for uh, some time now, he has been working with us on creating a blog post series. It's going to be released very soon, and it is going to be 
I, I would say, perhaps arguably, the first time that a Mormon father has come out publicly and not just talked about his child's suicide, but talked about how Mormon teachings contributed to his death. In the case of the Cal Farley Boys Ranch survivors, um, we've been involved with advocating for them for several years. Um, that started with uh, helping them uh, develop a community which was really important because those who first re started working with us were concerned that there were so many out there and how do, how do we find them? So we worked with them to start a Facebook group and at first it was private or secret, I guess Facebook calls it, and so, you know, it was just a few of them were reaching out to folks. Well, it's now, if you can see down there, it's up to 120 members. This is as of this morning. And this has not only been really beneficial uh, to these individuals to be in a community, be in a common space where they are communicating with people who understand. Um, but it's also been really empowering. And what I, I mean that in the sense of they, as a community, have a lot more power to see change. Uh, so for example, one of the things that was really important to the survivors was that Cal Farley's Boys Ranch, which is very um, well-funded, uh, set up a third-party organization where they could go to that third party and get their therapy paid for. Her. And it took some doing, but after enough public shaming, guess what? We just learned that last month that's exactly what has happened. And there is this organization called Presidium that's located outside of Amarillo, uh, excuse me, outside of Dallas. And so the survivors can contact them, be insured of total uh, confidentiality, be connected to a therapist in their area, and all of it's paid for by Boys Ranch. Um, one, thing, one thing else that we, we found was really um, exciting was not just to have their community be online, but in person. And so we organized a reunion for the survivors in Amarillo, and this was a chance for survivors and their loved ones to come together uh, some of these guys uh, saw for the first time, you know, in 50 years, uh, saw, saw other men that they remembered had been in their dorm at Cal Farley's. Uh, a lot of the survivors were just meeting each other for the first time. And again, it was that sharing of a common experience that really only only they could give to each other. So it was hugely important. Um, I'm gonna, oh, I'll just add one more last thing that um, we thought that in answer to their desire, I mean, this is probably what was most important to them of, of, of everything was getting the truth out. So many of them had been suffering in silence and been getting, you know, Cal Farley's slick marketing emails that just make it seem like the whole place is so rosy. They wanted the truth to come out. They wanted the public to know that this had been going on for decades. And there's a lawsuit out right now that has to do with abuses that took place really recently. So, so since the place started in, in 1939, we're talking now, you know, 67 years uh, of these problems continuing. Um, so our thought there was, we're all together. What do you think about putting on a press conference? And now these, these are, are men who have never talked publicly, uh, some of them talk publicly about their childhood trauma. They certainly have not been up in front of a microphone talking to a whole room of reporters. But when the question was posed to them, the answer was, hell yes. And uh, so we recorded uh, our time together in Amarillo at this reunion. It was a really wonderful experience. I learned a lot from them. And so I thought I would play uh, a few minutes from a video that, that we took. My dorm parent was sadistic. Um, he picked on the little kids. It was the small kids that were really the target of the dorm parent to pick on and to um, tease until they would 
cry, and then he would be able to rack them and put them on restriction. I was beat one time with over 150 licks with a belt by five men. That night I was taken to the Vega jail and put in the Vega jail. I spent two weeks by myself in the Vega jail reading a Bible and letting my bruises and cuts heal before the people at the ranch saw it. I was sexually assaulted twice while I was out there. The first person that sexually assaulted me, he made me and another person do things together. My brother was raped when he was 10 years old, but he, uh, he never told me until a few years, I don't know, about a year ago. That's been over probably 50 or 60 years he's had this buried in him. And um, it, it's awful sad when your brother tells you something like that and he's had to live with it for all these years. My father and two uncles spent 10 years at uh, Cal Farley's. And it was something we didn't talk about um, growing up. I just knew that they were tortured. My brother passed away a few years ago, but his whole life was nothing but torment. And once I learned from the survivors what really happened to him at Boys Ranch, it became crystal clear to me why he did the things that he did over the years. I could never figure out how my brother, who started out in Catholic school and was an altar boy and a model student, decided that he would shoot dope into his veins every day and be so silent, and we never knew what was going on. When one minute he would be okay, and the next minute he would be trying to kill himself. Cal Farley's ruined my family. My uncle Greg Botaw was a drug addict his whole life. He died behind a dumpster from a heroin overdose. My surviving uncle, bless his heart, he's changed, but he, he did what was done to him, to me and my brothers. So the abuse keeps going. We're all pain. Boys Ranch literally is killing me because when they did, when they did the abuse, or the dining hall restorations, they <laughs> it was asbestos. Everything out there was asbestos and they didn't remove it properly. And now I have pulmonary fibrosis, asbestosis, and I was told I won't even see my daughter graduate high school. So, um, you know, that was a really hard thing for these individuals to do. It took a lot of courage. It was extremely painful, but it turned out to also be really rewarding. Um, this whole thing is still continuing to escalate where uh, a group of them have wanted to start a nonprofit um, and try to try to do more for for the survivors um, we're still working with cal farley's boys ranch or at least trying to encourage them to do more for the survivors but but that's really the kind of outreach that we think has been the most effective People really respond when they see an individual sharing their personal story and also educating people about these issues. Um, there is a, a woman that I've started working with who is, uh, was complicit in the death of her child. Uh, she was part of a small cult that ended up starving the, her toddler child to death. I, it was actually the case that led me to write my book, um, Breaking Their Will. I had re begun a, a relationship with her mother and got to know her a little bit. And then many years later, the daughter reached out to me and I have to say that it was, I wasn't sure quite how to respond. I wanted to 
meet her needs, and I also had to think about the issues at hand and would this be helpful for people or not. But as it turned has, has turned out, I've really enjoyed my relationship with her. It's an ongoing um, uh, process where she is learning more about her own emotional development. I'm learning more about her process. So it's it's really been beneficial in that way, and I love how the the education continues. So. Uh, with that, I, I think I'll wrap up and ask if anyone has any questions or comments. I'm just wondering, you've got child-friendly faith in the name, and I'm wondering how, um, how you arrived at that, and are you trying to reach people that are of faith, or trying to say how you could raise your children in faith and still be child-friendly, or, or I'm just a little confused. Okay, so the question is about the name of the nonprofit called the Child Friendly Faith Project. And, and many people have asked about the name and what, what does it mean about um, our views on religious environments. Uh, is it okay to raise a child in religion or not kind of thing. Um, we come from an acceptance and acknowledgement that regardless of what kinds of um, conversations we may want to get into with people of faith, that religion is not going away and it never will go away. Uh, the nuns are certainly growing in number, but I'm also seeing other weird ideologies pop up in a whack-a-mole type fashion. Um, I don't remember the Flat Earther Society being quite so numerous as it is now, for example. Um, so I think that there is an aspect of human nature that they will want to hold on to a non-rational ideology, and they will use that in some way to harm children. Um, our mission is to I mean, to really boil it down, we just want religious people to treat their children better. And many of them do, but many of them don't. And so the idea of having faith be child-friendly is our main goal. One of our online viewers is asking how these uh, uh, revelations affected the operations of Cal Farley's voice range. Well, Initially, um, oh yeah, um, the question is, how has um, our partnership with the survivors of Cal Farley's Boys Ranch impacted the way they run the facility or the organization? Initially, I thought the answer would be, let's have some behind closed doors discussions. We would get survivors in a room with the the administrators, the CEO, and, and, and we would just open this whole thing up. Let, let's talk about it, you know. And they were very willing to have behind closed doors talks. What they weren't willing to do was to open the door. <laughs> um, I mean, this was a year of ongoing conversations, and it became very clear that they were willing to do all kinds of things as long as nothing was made public. And I had been warned about that, <laughs> having seen what has taken place in many other religious organizations, uh, from you know, Orthodox uh, uh, Jewish communities, the Catholic Church, and uh, some insulated Islamic communities. But I felt it was the right thing to give them the opportunity to, 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 to do a good job with this. Otherwise, if we were to then make it public, they could say, well, if you had just come to us, you know, we could have worked something out. So it was clear they weren't going to work anything out. And at that point, I contacted a reporter that I know with The Guardian, and he did a feature story. Um, and that was the first time that the survivors got to tell their story. Um, at that point, um, we were thrilled that when the it was, cameras and so forth and microphones were in front of the CEO of Cal Fali's Boys Ranch, um, they, they didn't deny it. 
They acknowledged the abuses took place, and they gave what the survivors had been wanting for at least a year, which was a public apology. It was a weak apology. It was not a real apology, but it was a semi-apology. It was, there were, the word in there, the, the word sorry appeared in there. After that took place, we continued to work with them, and uh, again, kind of things went dormant, and um, we, 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 had to, we had to blow it up again and do some more public shaming. And then uh, after that, we, we got a few more things accomplished. So at this point now, they have set up this third party uh, organization that, that I talked about, and, and we think that's making a huge stride. There are other things we, need, we would really, really like them to do, um, but that's yet to come. So was that it? More about the time. Okay, thank you very much.